Hello, and welcome to today's Leadership in Extraordinary Times event from Oxford University's Said Business School. And wherever you are in the world, whatever time it is right now, thank you for joining us. I am Mary Johnstone Louis. I'm Senior Research Fellow here at Oxford Said, And today we are discussing something truly extraordinary. Since its launch just over two months ago, the Better Business Act in the UK has gained support from more than 600 businesses across this country. This act is a campaign that is described as its intention is to change UK law to align the interests of people, profit and planet with every business's purpose and the responsibility of every business's directors. Specifically, the campaign's objective is to amend Section 172 of the UK's Company Act and to support these principles. So these truly are extraordinary times. Regulation and legal change are sometimes caricatured as a risk to business, but today we will hear from a CEO and an investor who support this legal change for business in the UK and have a chance to understand why. So we're looking forward to this conversation, both with the panelists and just as important with you and your questions for us and for them. But first, let me introduce my co-host for today, Shar Love, who is activist in residence and co-founder at B-Lab UK. She is also co-chair of B-Lab's Global Climate Task Force and an entrepreneur in residence here at Oxford Said. Shar, over to you. Well, thank you, Mary. And I think this is going to be a really great conversation today because we have amazing leaders who are going to be sharing their reflections on the Better Business Act. And I know, as Mary has already said, we're going to be hearing from you as well. Um, but let me start by introducing you to sort of two of our very special guests. Uh, first, we've got Douglas Lamont, who's joining us. He's the CEO of Innocent Drinks, and he also co-chairs the UK's Better Business Act. And again, as Mary said, this is the campaign that just launched a few months ago. And if I'm not mistaken, Douglas, I think this week we just hit 600 UK businesses in support. So I know we're going to hear a little bit more about it from you. Um, but I also think it's really important for us to also recognize the humans that are behind um, the people that we're going to be having joining us today. And so something about Douglas that you might not see in his bio is that actually, in addition to his two jobs as CEO of Innocent Drinks, as well as co-chair of the Better Business Act, um, Douglas is also a taxi driver because he has four children uh, that he often has to bring to different places. So welcome, Douglas. Um, I also know that you have a very uh, important power up song that you listen to. So when you're trying to get into the mood for the sort of economic systems change, um, you mentioned that sort of one of the songs on your playlist is American Idiot by Green Day. So uh, hopefully we can almost have a little bit of a Spotify playlist for all these power up songs. Um, so welcome, Douglas. Um, we're also joined by the one and only Amy Clark, who is the Chief Impact Officer at Tribe Capital, uh, Tribe Impact Capital, pardon me. Uh, and Tribe is the UK's first dedicated impact wealth manager, um, which works in partnership with clients to gain a deep understanding of their values and how these align with the UN SDG framework. I have my little SDG pin on here today, um, uh, Amy. Um, Amy is also on the board of B-Lab UK and something about Amy that you might not know um, that's not on her bio is that she actually has a three-legged rescue dog and we might actually see uh, in the background coming in um, and that she is happiest when she is barefoot in nature in her wetsuit. Uh, so again, welcome Amy. Um, and we know that your favorite song to get you sort of powered up for these economic systems change in these extraordinary times is the song Uprising by the Youth. So I'm definitely putting that on my playlist. Now, Mary, um, not only are you the senior research fellow here at Oxford Said, but you are also the chair of B-Lab UK. Um, and I have known you for a very long time, but I actually really enjoyed getting to know something about you that's not on your bio, um, which is that you thought you were going to be a cancer researcher and that you actually had as a first job um, cleaning medical equipment um, when you were a teenager. I think is pretty cool. So um, Mary, I also am going to be putting on my playlist your power up song, which is Bob Dylan, You Gotta Serve Somebody. So uh, anyways, my friends, we are joined by just an, a really amazing group of people. And as I said, as amazing as all these speakers are, we know that your contributions to this discussion are really important. So we want to actively get you involved. Please, please, please share your questions via the chat box on whichever platform you're watching from. That might be LinkedIn, it might be Facebook, 
It might be YouTube. I'm not sure if TikTok has a platform, but anywhere you are, just please keep those um, questions coming in. We just ask for you to keep those questions brief um, and make sure you're letting us know who you are and where you are. Um, all right, at this stage, I think we should just get tucked in. So Mary, over to you to kick things off with our amazing panelists. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Shar. And Douglas, I'm going to kick off with you. So the Better Business Act, it's a pretty lofty name, very ambitious. What is the Better Business Act, or sometimes affectionately termed the BBA? Why is it important? You're actually the co-chair. Why are you backing it? Well, well, Mary, first, you did such a fantastic job of explaining it in the beginning. I, I think I can go into retirement. But so in, 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 very, in very simple terms, you know, we, we are we're trying to change the Companies Act here in the UK to get company directors to really think very differently and change the mindset in boardrooms away from, you know, our responsibility is to profit maximize for our shareholders to how as directors of companies do we balance the needs of our shareholders, incredibly important in the system, but with other stakeholders. So so our people, our wider communities and the planet. And, and why we believe it's so important and why I'm supporting it is because, you know, we need the pace of change in, in the world around us to accelerate. You know, we've got a climate crisis. You know, we've got the beginnings of a, a, a social injustice crisis going on as well. And without speed of change accelerating, we, we, you know, we're not going to be able to lead, the, lead to a sort of fairer and more sustainable future. And, and that needs to happen quickly. In, in the UK right now, with the Companies Act as it's currently drafted, which ultimately says to directors, please maximise outcomes for uh, shareholders and maybe think about these other things. You've got inc incongruence because you've got, you know, a set of directors thinking, right, uh, do I need to profit maximise if I want to do something else? Can I do that? Does the law allow me to do that? Um, have I got active investors who are going to go after me if I don't just profit maximise? At the same time, you've got government who you know, definitely want to move in the right direction, but they're having to put in adjustment policies and strategies to say, well, how do we get business to behave itself? Uh, and so you've got the Companies Act asking directors one thing, government policy pulling in another direction or, or imposing sticks, if you like, to say, well, if you behave like that, then here's some law to stop you behaving like that. And, and our view is if, if we can get everything together and aligned, so directors are uh, pulling in the same direction with uh, the government, things will change faster. And, and and so it's so important that ultimately the mindset is how does people, profit and planet get put in balance by government, by company directors and by all of us as individuals, as, as consumers, as, as employees of companies. Um, and if we do that, you know, things will change faster. Who's behind the campaign? L um, lot, lots of different companies. Uh, so the thing I really like is the diversity of companies involved so you've got big companies like john lewis and iceland and you know businesses like my own at innocent drink supporting it but we've also got you know really small businesses coffee shops from cornwall but as well as Lon london law firms in investors um like amy you know there's there's a growing group of leaders from right across the uk that are saying you know, we need to make this change. We've also got the Institute of Directors supporting us and, and they're really important because they're the ones that teach the manual to directors about how they should behave. And, and they recognize that this change is, is needed. And, you know, for them to be supporting this campaign shows the kind of strength of feeling that's out there from businesses to say, you know, we want to go in the right direction and this change will help us. Thanks so much, Douglas. So interesting that one thing that we all share on this panel is a connection to an entity called uh, B Lab or B Corp. So B Corps are companies that are certified uh, due to a standard and also a legal change that they make. Uh, both of you uh, in Innocent uh, and in Tribe are have gone through that process. So is this a B Corps thing, uh, this, this Better Business Act? You, you alluded to the fact that it's not, but why does that matter? Um, it, it really matters because uh, so as B Corps, we've already committed to this change. So we, we've had to go through a fairly torturous process to change our articles of association to say, we're going to behave like this. But we, we want that change to be for everybody. And, that, and that's one of the key principles. If we make this change, it applies to all companies as, as a default rather than, you know, some, some annoying legal process that you have to go through to change it. It, it matters because, as, as I said earlier, diversity matters here. 
this is not some niche group of you know far out there companies that are that are sort of got their head in the clouds this is all types of companies from all over the world uh, you know and who who basically saying we need to make this change and as i said whether whether you're a big london law firm or you're a small um you know S scottish um it, you know investor or whether whether you know, we've got some great companies from northern ireland who you know who are in graphic design you know the, the diversity of leaders saying we want to pull in the same direction is really important so so it's much wider than than the b corp community um signing up for this and i, I think that just shows the strength of commitment to, to this type of change thanks so much so 600 companies and counting in just over uh two months so Shar, over to you well, it is funny, Douglas, as you've been um, reflecting, I've been writing down some of the words and I realize there's like a whole ABCs coming up from, you know, A for alignment, B, balance and business, C is change, D is diversity. And I'm not going to go through all 26 letters, but I did also want to pick up something else that I really heard from you, um, when you when you started reflecting on this question, which is, you know, the pace of change. And I'm going to put a U out there, which is like the urgency of action. Um, so, so thank you, because I think you brought a lot of the spirit of the BBA right front and center here. Um, and Amy, I want to move it over to you, because actually we know that there are sort of a series of core principles that are sort of grounding what the Better Business Act is focused on. Um, and they are align interest. They are about empowering directors, changing the default and reflect and reporting. And you know, Amy, you, you know how much we have in common around this idea of like accountants will save the world and this reporting piece in, in particular is pretty exciting. Um, but I'd like to know how you think about these principles from your perspective as an investor here in the UK. Well, Charles, just before I answer that, a couple of things. First, just to everybody listening, I'm really sorry. I actually lost my voice yesterday, so I'm hoping my voice is going to be okay for the duration of today. Um, and se secondly, Shaw um, mentioned that I like to go barefoot in nature in my wetsuit. I am not a, some kind of weirdo who walks around nature in her wetsuit. It's I like barefoot in nature and I like to be in my wetsuit in the water as well. So, Shaw, just in case you inadvertently gave people the impression that I want to run in the hills in my Patagonia. Um, it's a really good question in terms of why should investors be uh, emotionally and intellectually engaged in the Better Business Act. I think quite simply, um, you know, good investing is about finding the businesses of today and tomorrow. And these are the businesses that are future fitting themselves to succeed in a constrained world, um, a resource constrained world, uh, a world where inequality is rife. That for from an investment point of view means you really are going to be looking at businesses who understand the broader remit of working with stakeholders, understanding stakeholders' preferences, desires, understanding the constraints, the challenges that they're facing, and whether their businesses are contributing to that or whether their businesses are actually solving for that. So the Better Business Act is in, in many ways part of a suite of solutions that are out there that create a tide that raises all of these boats up and make it easier for investors to then understand which businesses out there actually really do understand the issues that they're facing because at the moment in the absence of regulation it's very very difficult investors are having to work really really hard to work out where those future fit businesses are um, so regulation and policy in the investment world um, as it relates to the sustainability of a business as it relates to the purpose of the business is absolutely required you know you and I, Shah, have spoken at length about, you know, as you've just mentioned, how accountants will save the world. You know, we look at one of the core parts, or one of the core, uh, core um, to arms kind of within the BBA itself is this notion of reporting and ensuring that all businesses report on their performance. At the moment, there's a plethora of different reporting standards. Um, some companies report, some companies don't report. Again, it's really difficult for investors to understand, you know, where they can go to find good reporting, annual reporting um, that is based on science. It's based whether on environmental science or social science, etc. Um, if we look at empowering directors as well, I mean, we only need to look back a couple of weeks now to Big Oil's Black Wednesday. The role of law is becoming more and more prevalent. And we've just seen that with Shell in the um, Dutch district court, that human rights has overridden the shareholder votes with regard to their energy, tra energy transition plan. Um, law, the changes that are required in law run very deep and, and very, very wide. But until directors understand the obligations and the responsibilities on them to run those businesses in a future fit way, recognizing all of those risks and op those opportunities, we will continue to have, I think, 
combative relationships with some companies and we'll continue to see too many companies taking safety, relative safety in the narrative of transition, we're transitioning, give us time, rather than those companies who have transitioned or, or who are transitioning with pace as well. So. The BBA is such a fundamental part, I think, of a suite of tools that require to help investors better um, allocate capital to those businesses that can provide those social, environmental and economic solutions to the challenges that we face. Thanks so much, Amy. I think that's really comprehensive and it, it leads me to really want to hear more, I think, from both you and Douglas. But, but Douglas, I'll start with you if that's OK around these are some lofty principles aligning interests empowering directors reflecting your uh your your, your impact in reporting um and what i would like to understand is how do you put this into practice for example douglas what would this look like if you were to change the way that you lead at innocent for example so how we've been leading at innocent for the last 20 20 years and and actually built, building on one of the questions in in the chat you know this isn't about uh stakeholders versus shareholders this is about bringing those th three two things together this isn't just the right thing to do this is the smart thing to do this is what drives value cr creates success for companies you know like innocent you know we've come from not existing 20 years ago to now being over half a billion of turnover and the number one in our category right across europe as a result of living these principles and being really clear on how you balance them now that that doesn't mean it's easy <laughs> it's really really hard because every day you know there are trade-offs and and ultimately every business leader has trade-offs even if they're trying to profit maximize but this introduces more items that or which you have to trade off you know the sustainability of your products the way that you treat your employees so the the, the, the more the more you, there's more to think about but ultimately getting it right delivers bigger and better outcomes, you know, in, in terms of, you know, as, as an employer, we, you know, we attract fantastic talent because we balance these principles and we think hard about that in terms of the value we get from attracting better quality talent ultimately allows the business to go forward. So it, no, no one's saying that this is to implement this as a director and this mindset is easy. It's not, it's really hard but it delivers better outcomes for your company and then delivers better outcomes for society as a whole and the planet and that's got to be a good thing you know we are in extraordinary times and they're extraordinary because they're dangerous times and and if we don't all work a bit harder and have to think a bit you know more wisely about how we do these things you know we're we're heading for 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 even more dangerous times but i think you know it's, so it's it's an ask for everyone to step up but it's a very doable ask and that's what myself and other B Corps have been trying to show and show encouragement for is that this is doable and you know hopefully showing the blueprint for others to follow. Thanks so much. Amy, anything you would add on how you've seen these principles be put into practice specifically from an investor point of view? Yeah, what I was going to say, I mean, just building on what Douglas has said and also just recognizing one of the um, uh, questions in, in the chat. We became a B Corp from um, inception. So when we set Tribe up, we knew we wanted to become a benefit, um, a B corporation. We also knew that we wanted to align ourselves with the new um, thinking around investment, which, as I said, is you know future fit investing. It's looking at uh, responding to the um, challenges that are outlined in the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so we built it in from scratch, which I think in some ways is is easier um, because you can you can build it around the new code as opposed to try and retrofit a business that has been initially built in the old code when you're having to effectively then recode um, it's still really really challenging though and I, and I think you know when we're out in um, as investors in the marketplace looking at businesses fundamentally 95 percent probably 98 percent of what we're looking at are businesses that have thrived in the old paradigm they've thrived with the old code and we know that the old code is unfit for purpose it's 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 Friedman 101 um you know the last 45 years the last 100 years of business and the code that business has has been predicated on is not fit for the next 45 the next 100 the next 200 the next 250 um so we're working in a system that has got an awful lot of 
errant code. It's got a lot of ghost code in it. And we're having to kind of work against that and get individuals and get businesses to understand the power um, of new code and what it can deliver for that business, short, medium and long term. We're having to fight short termism as well. So it's really, really difficult. But there are more companies out there who understand the imperative to transition, who either have transitioned or who are transitioning. There are more directors out there than probably we would think there are who get this. Um, but it is hard work. You know, we're having to, even as B Corps leaders, we're having to work actively, I think, on a day to day basis against the learning that we've had, whether that's been in school, whether that's been in university. You know, we have all been steeped in kind of that Friedman code um, and we're having to work against it and unlearn and relearn. Um, and I think a lot of that comes down to um, attitude and aptitude and courage um, at the end of the day is are people willing to step back and say am I part of the problem or am I part of the solution if I'm part of the problem can I become part of the solution very interesting perspective and so in terms of you know this perspective that you guys are sharing it sounds very promising we have a lot of optimism but what are the risks that this introduces for example Douglas what are the risks this would introduce for you from a business perspective? And then Amy, I'll ask the same to you. What are the risks uh, for investors from getting involved or supporting this kind of initiative? So uh, as, as the chair, you're not, gonna say, you're not gonna get me to say that there are too many risks uh, from sort of committing to, to support supporting it. I think <laughs> what, what, what I've heard as uh, co-chair, the, the concern that people have, and you know, we're already in discussion with the government about how we could go about implementing this is that as we make the change let let let's not make sh let's make sure that it doesn't open up what sometimes get described as a lawyer's charter for people just to go after directors for the sake of it and say right under these new rules we want to test you know that wh wh whether you're living up to them or not what 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 we want to make sure is that the change is done in the right way to make the, the system go faster and make that mindset shift in boardrooms and behaviors around directors rather than opening up to a thousand different you know legal avenues for people to attack companies because because that wouldn't make sense this, this is about creating alignment of mindset and, and action between government ngos business you know and, and and wider stakeholders and if if we can achieve that with the right wording that sets the right intent for everyone then, then we're going to be in good shape. So, so the risk is it doesn't happen because people are worried about that legal point. I don't think they should be, and I think the way that we're proposing to, to bring it in, you know, avoids that. And and you know, we're making that point pretty clearly. Uh, you know, uh, as you would expect me to say, from a if it were to be to, to be delivered into into law and every company in the UK, uh, you know, had to act against those principles. I think the boat will just go faster and move in the right direction and and whether that's around sustainability whether that's about livelihoods all of those things you know will act more quickly because the system will have been reset and mary you know much better than me whilst governance and and law and all that it can seem boring to people it is really important and it really is the fundamentals that then drive the actions behind it so you know make, making sure that the foundations of this are right will will speed up the change we want to see. Absolutely. So really, really helpful observations, Douglas. I'm going to push a little bit on this. So we have a very global audience typically for these sessions, but they're also very likely our businesses who are based in the UK, who are watching this and who maybe are asking themselves, what risks would I face as a business if I were to join this group of 600 plus companies who have supported the BBA? So I've heard you say that you don't think there are risks or that you don't you think those risks are, are mitigated in certain forms or that you think they are, are manageable. But what would you say to someone who who is interested, is is feeling that this is something that interests them, but that actually they're they're feeling a bit unsure? How have yeah. you been able to assuage that? So, so I think I guess the other the other element you hear is, oh, I'm worried. You know, I, I'm the CEO or I'm in the management team. We want to do this, but we're worried our shareholders won't like it. And and for me, I say, well, if you've got a competent leadership group who go to their shareholders and say we want to make this change whether that's becoming a b corp whether that's supporting the better business act it would be a pretty brave set of shareholders that say no we don't want our aligned leadership group to follow that path we want them to follow a different path so so i think if, if you're truly passionate about 
you know, stepping forward in this new direction of balancing people, profit and planet, which I hope an increasing number of people, you know, are and, and we're moving in that direction, have the confidence to sort of step forward into that space and, and take the risks and talk to your shareholders if, if, if you require that before, before signing up, because, you know, as Amy will talk to you much more eloquently than me, you know, increasingly investors want this as well. So, you know, the, the risks are, are, are disappearing with each day that passes, I would say. Amy, what's your view on that? Risks that you see being discussed um, among fellow investors, actually, on this this particular uh, proposition and this particular campaign. What risks have you identified? Um, I'm sorry to sound a little bit like a broken record. <laughs> Um, and to follow Douglas, but there isn't really any downside risk associated with this. The only downside risk is in if it doesn't happen, um, what we then don't have is, as I said, that rising tide that raises all boats and makes it much easier for investors to understand the route direction of travel for a business. In the absence of um, uh, uniform regulation that, that covers very much the essence of being a sustainable business, it becomes really, really hard for us to, to work out which ones are intentional and material um, and which ones aren't. And in that environment, you end up getting a lot of greenwashing, a lot of impact washing, a lot of SDG washing. Um, you get a lot of presentation of core business as sustainable, which when you then obviously do the due diligence is anything but sustainable. So there isn't really, I think, a downside um, associated with this. I mean. To Douglas's point, there are enough shareholders out there now who understand what this is about and understand that this is future fitting, increasing the resilience of your investments long term. It's about good investing, identifying good businesses as well. The businesses, as I said, that are of today and tomorrow. Consumers get it as well. Consumers understand it. We had the survey that we did last year ahead of this campaign. You know, 75 percent of the UK public are, are ready for something like this. Um, and that's likely to be played out in a lot of markets around the world so we know consumers are ready for this as well and if i take my my, my kind of clients you know my, my end audience the, the people who come to tribe the reason they're coming to tribe the reason they want to partner with us is because in the absence of this regulation and policy we're pushing for it anyway we're doing this with our core investment thesis and this is what they want it's what they're ready for it's what it's the mechanism through which they um express their values and their beliefs and the passion for the change that they want to see in the world so you have this nexus happening between investors business leaders, consumers, wealth holders, <clears throat> everybody's coming together. So I really don't genuinely think there is a downside to getting involved in this. There is a downside in it not happening. Um, but, you know, the more of us who step up and lean in and, and create the, the unified voice for this, the more likely it is that what, it will happen and it will lead to great things. Thanks so much, Amy. Well, I'm sure we'll pick up more uh, healthy debate in Q&A. So by all means, send the questions through. We're looking forward to making sure we have time for that as well. But if you're just joining us, this is our Leadership in Extraordinary Times event, uh, which is put together by our team here at the University of Oxford Saia Business School. I'm Mary Johnstone Louie. I'm a senior research fellow here. And today's subject is focusing on better business. If you're just joining now, you'll be learning very quickly that we're specifically examining the UK's Better Business Act Act. And I'm joined by uh, Douglas, uh, and I'm joined by, apologies, um, by J Douglas Amont, the CEO of Innocent Drinks, uh, by Amy Clark, who is Chief Impact Officer uh, at Tribe Impact Capital, and Char Love, who, among many other roles, is activist and residence at BLAP UK. So by the way, all of these discussions are also available as a podcast. You can search for Leadership in Extraordinary Times from wherever you get your podcast content, and you can catch up on this and previous events. Thanks so much. Char, over to you. Oh, thanks, Mary. And I, I've just got pages of notes and drawings from this last sort of round of questioning. Um, and this point about the dangerous times, it's almost like this question of what side of history do we want to be on is sort of something that I'm, I'm going to sit with for, for a while. Um, but I want to move track a little bit because we've actually just here in the UK had the G7 um, down in Cornwall. And many eyes now, I think, are starting to look towards COP26, which is on the Global Climate Conference of Parties, which is going to be taking place in Glasgow um, later on this year in November. And so I guess I want to start with you, Amy, if I may. I wondered how you see the work of the Better Business Act linking to COP26. 
Mm. Well, I think if we look at what's come out of COP26, we've seen, um, you know, uniform support for um, uh, a, a global threshold for corporation um, tax. Now we can debate, <laughs> we can debate probably until the cows come home, whether it's been set at the right level. Um, but for the first time in sort of business and human history, we have this unified global pact to tackle the is thorny issue of corporate tax. Um, we've also seen a unified global call for um, TCFD and climate disclosure as well. And this is where it starts to get, I think, really interesting with things, for example, like TCFD and climate disclosure um, and reporting. One of the key tenets of BBA is reporting. Now, as part of the announcement that came out of G7, not only was there wholesale, obviously, support widespread um, support for deploying the TCFD more widely, and that's likely to go into the G20 is it this month or next month? It's likely to go to the G20 anyway, and hopefully garner even more support there. Um, but within that statement as well was a call for support, sorry, a call to support even, uh, the work of IFRS Foundation on uniform sustainability reporting as well. And again, Char, getting back to the role of the accountants in saving us from ourselves. Um, you know, there's a huge, um, I think, um, growing interest in, in, in the role of accountancy as it uh, links to reporting, but accountancy also links into aligned stakeholders, you know, looking at how do you cost in the true value of doing business, the true impact on stakeholder communities, how do you factor that into balance sheet? Um, and again, this is all coming through ahead of COP. So COP has hopefully um, huge benefit for something like the BBA in showcasing how the BBA can sit alongside all of these different calls for action, you know, whether it's corporate taxation, sits within the BBA um, to a certain degree, whether it's for more uniform reporting and disclosure, again, alignment with the BBA, whether it's understanding climate equity and climate justice, again, sits within the BBA with you know aligned stakeholders. There's huge, huge amount of crossover between what we're doing with BBA and what has been happening and what continues to be discussed as part of the COP26, um, run up to COP26, and obviously hopefully the negotiations later this year. So. The BBA, uh, I think for us as an investor, is nothing but supportive and additive to the conversations already way, already underway on climate. Great. I have to say, Amy, I did bring my T-shirt, so it was already here. You know, <laughs> the world one, I always have it by my desk, and uh, I know it's going to be one that I probably will wear um, when we're at <laughs> COP26. Um, Douglas, can I come to you? Because I'd be curious your views on, again, the link and how you see, building on what Amy's just sort of shared, um, the Better Business Act really fitting within sort of the road to COP26 and what we hope to see happen here in the UK. Yeah, I, I think with, with all these big, big events, there's obviously a lot that's kind of pre pre programmed. But I think what where they're really helpful is is bringing a sense of urgency, you know, in terms of what's required. So, you know, obviously COP26 and and the focus on the environment, an absolutely essential element of what we're trying to do with the Better Business Act, and and why Nigel Topping, who is basically organizing the whole event and kind of chief champion of it from a UK government perspective is is out there saying he thinks the Better Business Act uh, it, you know should be supported and is a good thing and and we need to make it happen um, you know for us it's a great opportunity to kind of get visibility and get urgency about these changes as well as obviously support the wider initiatives around COP26 in terms of the you know the, the specifics of climate change Obviously, the, the Better Business Act goes slightly wider than that in terms of the change we're looking for. But yeah, I, I think they just it's just helped with G7 and COP26 in the UK this year to create that sense of urgency, but, but also see the increasing number of voices that are coming out from business in support of all the various different initiatives. As Amy says, you know, we're, we're getting momentum here. This is now about speed. Yes, I love this idea of both speed and momentum and how do we activate on it. Um, well, and as, as some of you may know at B-Lab, uh, one of the big COP26 activations that we're in the process of planning is uh, an activation campaign called Boardroom 2030, where we're inviting companies, B Corps and non-B Corps from around the world to host a boardroom meeting as if it were in 2030. And that'll include really having to think through like who's around the table, who are your board members, um, what is on the agenda, how are decisions being made and, and what rules are needing to be followed? Uh, and I wondered if you'd both just sort of share a few sort of reflections and riff a little bit on imagining what you think boardrooms in 2030 are going to look like. And maybe, Amy, can I start with you? What does a, what does a boardroom look like in 2030? Well, I hope, Shah, radically different to, to the way that a boardroom currently looks. I think that goes without saying. Um, 
2030 boardroom has really got to reflect the society that we live, work, and play in. Um, and if, you know, as, as a as a businesswoman looking at boards on a regular basis, obviously as an investor, um, you you need to have diversity represented in all forms within that board. It's not just gender diversity. It's ethnic diversity. It's socioeconomic diversity. It's cognitive, neurological diversity. Um, obviously, there's age diversity as well. You and I, Shah, have spoken at length about the need to get the next generation through onto these boards as well, equip them to be able to um, understand how to work at board level, but we need to get them through. You know, you, you need to be reflecting your stakeholders on your board. Now, you also need to be reflecting the core skills and talent and experience that is required to be able to really advise that company. And I had a really interesting conversation with somebody the other day who was talking about expertise. And obviously, what you need is expertise on a board. You do, but you can't have expertise without lived in experience. You've got to have that lived in experience. And I think at the moment, what we're finding with a lot of boards is we may on paper have, you know, sort of the traditional white collar, been to all the, you know, the necessary universities, got all the necessary diplomas. Have they actually got the lived in experience of what that company's core product and service is ultimately a tackling or b what that company is exposed to no they don't so it's it's you know diversity in all forms including that lived-in experience and being able to ensure that your board really understands the footprint that your business has and also has the experience of working with the solutions to tackle those footprints um, so i can't tell you exactly what it's going to look like but i i i know what you know the, the the, the mechanisms and I think and the 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 criteria that I'm looking for and it's exactly what I've just outlined. Beautiful. Well, thank you. And and I think it's going to be really interesting to see how a lot of different businesses um, address some of these questions and really this point of lived experience I think is going to be quite critical. To mention one of the other sort of creative questions that's coming up um, as we sort of start talking to businesses about hosting a boardroom 2030 meeting is also where those meetings happen. Are we going to see board readings happen um, underwater? Are we going to see them in forests? Are we going to see them in schools? So there's a real lot of interesting scope to explore some of these issues sort of using a, a creative imagination approach. Um, Douglas, I wondered if I could come to you with this question. Um, what do you think a boardroom is going to look like in 2030? I think you know, slightly well building on Amy's point yeah, and, and something that we are thinking a lot more about is how do we listen better uh, so you know I think it's been it's very easy as business leaders you take your experience you take the issues at hand that you think are the issues and you just kind of get on and make decisions and try and inject some pace into you know how your company's performing I, I think something that certainly the, the sort of Black Lives Matter uh, activity of the last 12 months has really taught me is actually slowing down a little and listening a little more is good for business and and making sure that those voices of all those different types of stakeholders are listened to represented in that decision you still might you still might not check of everybody but doing doing some good listening before deciding from a wider group rather than the six or seven people that sit around you on a on a day-to-day -day basis and cheer you on as ceo um is I think going to be the fundamental difference from now until 2030. And I think investors will insist on it, employees will insist on it, and the power of employees fortunately goes up with every day that passes. I think employees have a louder voice than they realize inside companies and, and will learn how to use it more effectively as well. So whether that's shadow boards merging into kind of a blended boards, I think will be really important. I, I can't see us doing it underwater. I have to say, by 2030, May, maybe 2050 for that. But but um, some some things don't change as quickly as you would imagine. If you only look if you look back to 2015, it's still it's still tea biscuit and cake round the table. Well, fair, fair enough to that. Um, I'm, I guess I'm just I'm trying to channel um, Amy wearing wetsuit and, you know, whether, <laughs> where is the place that it could go in, in the next sort of, you know, uh, nine or eight years. But you're right. I think there's going to be sort of a range of questions we can ask. And I think 2030 is one question, but actually thinking 2050 might be another a whole, whole other set of boardroom activations we think about. Uh, so thank you both. Um, at this stage, I think I'm going to turn it over to you, Mary, because I think you've been keeping an eye on sort of some of the excellent questions that have been coming in through uh, through the chat function. Absolutely. No, it's been a really, really dynamic chat, which is exactly what we want. So keep them coming in no matter where you are in the world. Uh, put them into the platform of your choice. And 
I think there's one theme that we really need to address head on, which is coming through quite clearly. I'm gonna pick up the question from Andy Hawkins. And just to paraphrase, he's saying, the early adopters of this approach to business, and within that we might include B Corps as well as others, are fabulous, but respond, but his question is, don't they represent a minority view? How do you, or how does the BBA get out of what would, we could call an echo chamber and really become mainstream? So this is a question really, I think, for, for Douglas primarily, and also for your, you, Amy, around what have you seen around trying to make these messages more palatable, more exciting, more engaging uh, for a wider range of audiences? Yeah. I I totally agree. I mean, we, we we definitely need to break the echo chamber. And why one of the key principles here is that this becomes the default for everybody. Because when I talk to a wide wide groups of different types of leaders of all different types of companies, it, it's not usually that their intent isn't there. It's they, they don't know where to begin or, or how to start acting or having having the board meetings or, or you know, in, in case of small companies, it's not that formal in terms of the discussions about how they do things differently. So, so I think the the Better Business Act is a, is a foundational piece that then, you know, it creates an environment where people have to think differently, you know, start behaving differently. And then what needs to follow and come alongside all of that is the tools and the support and the techniques of how you do that better as, as a small company, as a medium sized company, as, as a big, big multinational. So, you know, and I saw a question earlier about, you know, is it good that you have these things called B Corps that sort of sit as unique companies? No, nothing would please me better if everybody followed really, really high standards and that was the standard that was the law and B Corps didn't have to exist. All, all we're trying to do is B Corps or campaigning for the Better Business Act is is shift where the mainstream are to to a kind of to a to a slightly you know different different place. So I'm not I'm not trying to create unique clubs. I think everyone in B Corp would love B Corp not to exist. It exists to prove that sustainable capitalism is a successful model in order to encourage others to follow, not to kind of create high walls and block others out. So we're trying to democratize this. Yes, we're at the front end of it, but but I, I'm reaching my hand back to say, you know, how, how can we bring everybody with us? I guess it's the intent that we have. If we're seen as elitist or unique or the 1%, that's not great because everybody needs to change. Innocent being good at, on its own is pointless. It doesn't create the change that we need. I, I think the urgency of change will hopefully come through. Now, it's different from a pandemic where it's right in front of your eyes, but a climate crisis and, and other inequalities in the world, I think are going to start to cause very, very visible problems that will make real up everybody and hopefully mainstream companies or, or the 50 percent, 60 percent of companies know that we've got to do things differently. And, and the war for talent will also drive some of that as well, uh, because more and more individuals are choosing the type of company they want to work for and that that's that that's change is coming fast and and therefore you know companies will follow that well thanks so much and i think what we're picking up on is also a question that's coming to us from india um, this is from trish sharma thanks so much for your question trish and it's around this idea that initiatives like the bba are a systemic approach to looking at a problem as opposed to, for example, a company individual led uh, approach to looking at a problem. And so what I think Trish is picking up in her question is the issue of collaboration and what have, has been your experience or what do you see as the future of collaboration between business and, for example, civil society organizations, NGOs, what kind of collaborations do you think will be required in order to meet some of the achievements and some of the goals that the BBA sets to uh, achieve? And uh, either of you, Amy, go ahead, please. I was gonna say, I think, I think one of the really interesting things that's come through um, in the last few years is this notion of corporate social venturing um, and a shift in that dynamic between the sort of the philanthropic relationships that you that we have had historically between the charity world um, and the business world and this to your point Mary this sense of collaboration and partnership and really understanding what that can lead to um, you know we're seeing for example in, in the investment space we're seeing some very interesting tie-ups between very well-known social enterprises and charities and fund managers, you know, bringing the, the charities straight the social enterprise, bringing their expertise of whatever social or environmental or economic issue that they may have the expertise in, bringing that to the fore to say, if you want to tackle this issue 
and you want to bring the, the might of the public marketplace to helping tackle this issue, let's work out how we can collaborate in creating an investment vehicle that focuses on those businesses who do get it, who are tackling it, who are creating those solutions. This is already happening and we're seeing corporate social venturing now, I think, start to seep out and become, it's not mainstream, but I think it will become mainstream in redefining that relationship, which I think has always been quite, um, it's been an unhealthy relationship, I think, sometimes um, when you look at, uh, you know, the way that business and charities often, often partner. Um, you know, this has got to be a partnership of equals, recognizing that those on the front line, those NGOs, those social enterprises have real gold in the insights and the knowledge they have around those disenfranchised or marginalized communities or fractured ecosystems. They know what works. They know how to create solutions for this. And if those solutions sit in your supply chain, as in you know, the problem that is being created sits in your supply chain, whether it's upstream or downstream, then this isn't a philanthropic partnership or relationship. This is a solutions-based partnership that fundamentally tackles how you run your business and what your core product and service does. And that recodes, I think, the relationship massively and then leads to hopefully knock-on effects within how your broader stakeholders as a business then look at what it is that you're doing. So Trisha's question is brilliant and it's a really, really good question because we do now, I think, need to inhabit a world where there is more corporate social venturing. There's, a, there's more equality between charity and business. At the end of the day, we are all business is, you know, whether it's it's the difference in how we <laughs> utilize and treat our profits. Um, but we're all trying to be successful at what it is that we do. And we all have our unique insights and gifts that we can bring. Um, so for me, I think CSV is going to be very, very interesting over the next few years to see where that takes us. Corporate social venturing. Thanks so much, Amy. And it, it reminds me of something that I've heard. Shar, I'll pull you in here to have you share a little bit of your perspective on something called the movement of movements, which I think is very connected to the question that Trish is asking. Um, if you could share a little bit about that in response to this question that Trish has raised. Yeah, and it's a great question, and um, and just great to hear, Amy, your your reflections on on corporate social venturing. It's it's great to hear from your perspective as an investor, where you're seeing that um, become increasingly part of of the conversation. Um, and Mary, yes, to the point about the movement of movements. I mean, this was very much um, inspired by some of the work you did a few years ago on in pursuit of inclusive capitalism. And it's just recognizing actually that there are a series of, of, of levers that we know or interventions um, that will be needed to be pulled in order to drive these systemic changes that we've been talking about today. And actually recognizing that one of the things we can do to really work on with speed and strength and urgency, um, pulling those levers is find new ways to collaborate. And, and that might be with collaborating with people who have a similar view of what system intervention they want to be activating. Um, but might be coming from different sectors and might be coming from different movement organizations. But the more important uniting forces, the change that they want to see happen. Um, so I think a really important step to doing that is, is to map like where these interventions are, who's working on it and, and busting down sort of some of the silos that can exist and really actively finding ways in doing this mapping, um, identifying where those opportunities for collaboration exist. Um, so I, I would say if people are interested in this to actually check out some of your research that you did um, a few years ago around this in pursuit of inclusive capitalism that starts mapping out these levers. Um, and, and again, looking quite actively for the types of partners you can work with that might be different ones than, than you've traditionally worked with, but reflect this sort of spectrum of different organizations and sectors. Thanks so much, Shar. Anything else that you would add, Douglas, on that particular collaboration question? No, I, I think increasingly what you'll also see is collaboration between companies and we're, and we're already seeing it so you know from our perspective we're building what i hope will be the world's most sustainable food and drink manufacturing site in rotterdam right now and we've committed that we're going to completely open source all the learnings about that good and bad to even our closest competitors because sustainability has to be a team sport it can't be a source of competitive advantage you know back to my point earlier innocent being good on its own doesn't achieve anything. We we all we all have to move. The buffalo herd has to move. So I think what you'll see, and and we're already seeing, beyond just B Corps, more and more companies coming together to solve some of these big problems and work together on things that 20 years ago it would have been so like, no, they're my competitor. I mustn't talk to them. That that's changing really fast. So co collaboration, yes, to NGOs and others, but but also between companies that were historic competitors. I think you'll see more and more of it. 
No, absolutely. Thanks so much, Douglas. And I think I want to open it up to think about, you know, this really is an ambitious campaign. And I wanted to think about a question that's come in from Steve Podmore, uh, which is asking, what would it take to get this over the line? So on the point of collaboration and support, what does the BBA need? I'll ask you um, specifically, Douglas, when you feel like the kind of resources, you know, whether it's, it could be philanthropic, it could be uh, partnerships with other companies. You, you mentioned the Institute of Directors has been very supportive. Of what else is needed? That's a question that's coming in from yeah. Steve. Thanks so much for that. That that and, and I'll build on another question of you know what, what's the, what's the sort of counter argument and what why no if you like. I, I think you know and we've started conversations you know with MPs and with government and you know we've got good cross party support. We had a launch in Parliament three or four weeks ago where we had speakers from every single party uh, you know in support, which is quite a rare thing. And and specifically with the government. Again, the conversations we've had with them, that they are supportive of our outcomes. The challenge for any government, as for anyone that knows that world, and I'm learning fast, is that actually legislative, legislative change is liquid gold because there's so actual little time in Parliament to debate these things and what are the priorities across their full agenda. So what we need is it's not really about money. It's about it's about commitment and voice. Every, every individual and every company and every institute of directors you've got a drum you've got a you've got a drumstick just beat the drum and if we're all beating the drum loudly saying we want this change to happen and government are hearing it more and more and you know we know consumers are with us you know in all the polling we've done 70 80 percent of consumers are saying what do you mean this isn't already happening why not uh so we've got we've got business support we've got consumer support we've got good cross-party support but we need that business support to be louder and louder so they realize that it isn't just 600 companies it's 6,000 60,000 leaders in the UK saying we want this change because we think it will drive you know all the things that we've talked about here so it's about not just signing up because you, you, you know hopefully lots of people could, will sign up to this following this and other events but it's then saying how do I want to show up as an individual? Am I going to go out and campaign for this? Am I going to go out and convince my, you know, five friends that also run companies to support this? So, you know, b bang that drum loudly and encourage others to do it is re is really key to this. It's it's less about money because this is more about. I think the government, you know, in a in a in a in a legislative uh, unrestricted environment, I think this is the kind of thing that would go through. So this is just about making sure that our voice is loud and heard and they realize we should be one of their top priorities, not one of their medium priorities. Thanks so much, Douglas. And in terms of your own experience of getting the support uh, really from your own board and from your own leadership team for this, uh, is there anything you can share that might be useful uh, by way of lesson uh, for others who are thinking about this topic at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I guess it wasn't hard for my board and you know from my fellow directors you know this is kind of how how we think obviously my company is owned by coca-cola you know one of the you know one of the world's biggest companies and again you know when i said becoming a b corp or supporting this act they're like well that's that's who you are that's what you you know you you, you represent as as innocent absolutely we're fully supportive and, and also they want to see and learn you know from it as well so it was a relatively smooth path as i said earlier if if you've got a committed leadership team that believe in something, it's a brave investor that turns around and says, no, we want to do completely opposite because they're risking that high quality leadership team going, well, OK, we want to do something different, too, in another company. So I, I think it's about your own self. You know, it's about your own self commitment to it and then being brave with that, which is ultimately what makes change happen. Um, it's, you know, it's not passive nodding, saying that sounds nice. It's active. I'm going to do something about this and I'm going to join the movement, if you like. Mary, can I just add, add to what Go ahead, saying, Amy, yeah. Uh, yeah, just to add to what um, Douglas was saying as well. I mean, obviously, um, in a public marketplace where you're likely to have a quite potentially quite a diverse number of shareholders, there is nearly always going to be one who will understand what it is that you're trying to do. In a private marketplace, it might be a little bit different. But in a public marketplace, you know, with somebody, for example, like Innocent, um, any other of the sort of the, the, the listed companies out there, there are more impact driven and sustainably oriented investors out there than you might at first imagine, given what's especially what's happened over the last 18 months um, globally, but also within the markets as well. So I would add to what um, Douglas was saying is 
Get to understand your shareholders as well, really well, their motivations, why they've invested in you, what it is that they really like about you, what excites them about you as well. And you'll be quite surprised often when you start to sort of really understand them and understand their motivations for being you know, um, part of your journey, that you've probably already got some sustainably uh, minded and purposeful investors already in with you. Get to know them, use them, get them to help you if you are struggling, if you are having any sort of points of resistance, broaden the team. You know, the pitch on the team at any one time is not just the people who work for the company, it's all of your stakeholders. So identify them, get them on the pitch with you and then start to make that, that, that noise about why you want to support this. Thanks so much, Amy. Shar, over to you. Well, I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm certainly feeling like sort of an itch in my fingers and sort of like a, a tickle in my toes to just want to get acting. And so um, with this sort of drumbeat sound in the background, uh, I wanted to turn it to Douglas and, and then you, Amy, very briefly just to say, what can we all do in, about this? Like, what is the call to action um, that you would like to encourage everyone that's tuning in to this uh, Leadership in Extraordinary Times to do? So Douglas, what can we do? What's our action? And again, I've sort of changed what I thought I might say. Uh, in terms of that, how do we make mass change happen, which is one of the questions. I guess one of the calls to actions is we haven't cracked it, right? So, you know, we're sitting here going, we want to change. We want this to become a mass thought process. But so one of my call to actions, if you've got good ideas around that, if you've got experience around that, pl please come towards us. You know, we're, we're here believing in this stuff, doing our best, but we're not perfect humans either with it, all the answers. So, so i'm listening so if people have got good ideas off the back of this about how to make this campaign accelerate how to in general drive wider mass change please please get in contact with me and and the campaign team and, and we'd love your help as it were of of course sign up but basically choose how you want to turn up as a human in the next five years i think it's a really important time in in human history and you know there's this sort of unclear threat in front of us that's getting louder and louder and, and the more of us act and really step into this space whether it's supporting the bba whether it's leading your company in a different way or whether it's doing other things as a as a, as a citizen as a consumer and you know types of companies you you support through your purchasing habits re really consciously think about how you want to show up in the next five years because i think it's a really important time beautiful amy what's your call to action for all of us today Revolution's going to be crowdfunded and the crowd is us. Okay. So building on what Douglas said, obviously sign up, write to your MP, ask them to support this. Um, speak to your friends and family, spread the gospel, spread the gospel as wide and as far as you can. You know, this change is absolutely required. The time is here and the time is now. And we need everybody to kind of get to not just business leaders. We need everybody. We need the crowd to come and support us with this. So if you can spread the message. Love it. I actually just got a little bit of goosebumps there. So thank you both. Um, I, I am simply going to add to the call to action here is that there is more information on the BBA website for anybody who wants to learn more. And I would just invite anyone who's also interested in empowering your director, directors uh, by exploring maybe hosting your own boardroom 2030 meeting. So please feel free to reach out if that's of interest to you. I think, Mary, we are coming to the very end of our wonderful hour together. So I'm going to turn it over to you to close us out. Just a few comments. Just first of all, thanks to everyone who tuned in. Thank you to the team. Thank you to the panelists and, and to you, Shar. I think just to say this is a radical session. It's, it's out of the box. It is one of the things that looks like extraordinary, extraordinary times, leadership in extraordinary times. And this idea of looking at this kind of change is a radical thing. And it touches on a lot of research that goes on in all corners of the school. So everything from the knowledge equity program at the school center, which Amy, you touched on the idea of uh, lived experience and the importance of that, all the way to the work that's going on on uh, reporting and standards of reporting that are going on with, for example, uh, scholars, including Richard Barker and Bob Eccles here. This touches on so much the school is interested in. There is no one uniform view on these topics. We want to stimulate debate and we just want to thank you for being part of it. Uh, our theory of change you can hear a little bit more about in a piece that Shar and I wrote uh, just recently. It's available on hbr.org, harvardbusinessreview.org, um, and it looks about how do you move beyond the idea that individual CEOs here uh, as heroes, with all respect to, to Douglas, will make the kind of systems change that uh, we're just talking about in this session. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you can always pick up on previous sessions and this one online and really, really appreciate all your great questions. Thanks so much, everybody.